Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily, and I am with the Miami University Alumni Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our virtual wine tasting with Jack Keegan. Jack is an instructor emeritus who taught the ever popular viticulture and enology class for 25 years at Miami. Jack's wine class is always full, his wine tastings are always well attended, and tonight is no exception. The Miami University Alumni Association is so excited for the opportunity to bring Jack to you as we celebrate spring in the warm weather. As you can see, Jack is out on his porch enjoying the beautiful weather in Oxford. There is an ask a question box located um, on the bottom of the screen. I'll be monitoring these questions throughout, so please feel free to ask any questions you may have, and I will relay them to Jack throughout the tasting. So with that being said, go ahead and take it away, Jack. Thank you, thank you, Emily. Good evening, everyone. I hope the weather is as nice there. Of course, you know how it is. It's going to be 35 in a couple of days here in, in Oxford, so it'll go back and forth, but it's April. That is to be expected. But beautiful flowers, a beautiful day, nice and warm tomorrow. In fact, we have an electric uh, roots festival in Oxford tomorrow. If you're in the vicinity, you should stop by. I think it's going to be really a lot of fun from two to nine uptown in the park. So that will be, in fact, uh, uh, really a great thing. So I guess we'll get started. Um, uh, here, of course, to spring, or are we just going to get fooled again? We have had, and that's one thing, as you probably all know, Facebook is so good at doing, and that is reminding us that, in fact, on April 21st last year, it snowed here in Oxford. I've got some really good pictures, but I didn't put them up tonight. So it was, it will happen. Of course, it goes back and forth, but I think we're pretty much in the clear after this one, at least from what I look like in all of that. So as usual, uh, this is not moving. Why isn't it moving? I'm pressing and nothing's happening. Um, so at the bottom of where you see your slide to the bottom of the screen, if you hover down, you'll see a little arrow that you can click. Okay. There you go. Huh. Maybe it'll go from now on. I'll check. If not, I'll use that. Thank you. Uh, as usual, we talked about the wines that we're doing and the list of wines. So I thought I would tell you that first, the uh, uh, Abaria de Campo Alborino, uh is the first. Um, and I apologize. I, in fact, drove down to Jungles today to get the Burgans because they told me they had it in. And they he went to the shelf and it's like, oh, it was there. He realized, in fact, he's sometimes at the other store. And so they don't, didn't have it. So I apologize. The Cambria Chardonnay, Catherine's Vineyard from Santa Maria Valley. The Malartic La Gravier, La Reserve de Malartic. It's their sort of second label uh, from Bordeaux, Pesac Leonian. Uh, the Tasca de la Merita uh, Regaliali, Rosé. We'll talk about that also, about being in Sicily. Uh, the Niner Bujac Red from Paso Robles. And then the Chateau Marjos, um, from also from Bordeaux, from Entre de Meur. Uh, and if you cannot find it, I do have a bottle of 16 Clarendel that I will, in fact, uh, speak a little bit about also. As you also know, no, I will have to go up there. That's fine. Um, this, that we always, of course, start with tasting a wine. Um, I usually show you how to open a bottle. In fact, I'm going to open the Marjos here. Uh, for that, because if you have the Abadio de San Campo, you know it's a screw cap, so it's a lot easier. Um, as I said, I usually go into this and put the wine or you know around the top. Um, in fact, it's funny. So this year, and of course, I know part of it is age, but it was like, as John Dome always said, he never took the capsule off of the top of the bottle. You always go around and simply take the top of the capsule off. And so I, I said, you know, that as John said, it makes the bottle look naked if you take off the entire capsule. And so I just happened to remark, I thought very benignly, that, you know, there are some things I like to see naked. Bottles aren't one of them. And the students basically like all inhaled, like, oh, my God, how could you say that? And of course, I'm like, work with me, people. We all like to see something naked. So it's like, give me a break. So, so you know, they had to agree, of course. And so that is, in fact, how that went. It's one of those things about teaching. Always the moment. So I always put the thing right in the middle. And so it's there. I really like the double hinge corkscrew, as you know. And so I can lift it up and it comes out very, very easily. And so that is a very good way 
to open and a very easy way to open a bottle. <laughs> of course, this is an especially easy way to open a bottle uh, with the screw caps. And and truthfully, you know, there are so many good wines that come in screw caps. And most wines, as you've probably heard me say before, 90% of all wines should be drunk between one to three years of bottling. And so a screw cap, you're not going to age these wines. And so it's perfectly fine, a screw cap. And especially a white like an Albarino, um, happens to work very, very well with this. So we'll taste this wine first before I talk a little bit more about it. It is a beautiful pale uh, yellow. We often call use that pale straw term for that. Very clear, very clean. And if you swirl this wine, mm, beautiful fruit flavors, very tropical. Maybe a little mango, maybe a little pineapple. Really very nice, clean, bright, beautiful for an evening like this evening. I didn't ask the Cardinal to come and sing, but it managed to get it here anyway, as you probably just heard. And if you taste this wine. Yum. Just so tasty, clean, fresh, peachy, uh, pineapples, a little mango, almost a little grapefruit too. Just so bright and clean. <laughs> it's the kind of bottle where it's like, oh, where'd that bottle go? You know, I mean, it's one of those things where you could just drink it so easily. And it's probably only about 12.5% alcohol would be my guess. I'm having someone look at the bottle to tell me for sure. Maybe 13 because I feel a little bit of heat. 13.5? Oh, 12.5. Yeah. So 12.5 uh, for this. Um, really what better way to start the evening than to have a glass of this? I mean, just it's just so pleasant, so nice, so enjoyable. Just a beautiful wine. Just really, really nice. Mm. Lovely. A little bit about this wine. This is very neat, um, Emily, how you can do that. Um, this is the Rias Baixas. Uh, as you can see, it is right north of Portugal in Spain. This is what we call green Spain, uh, because as you can see, the Atlantic Ocean is right there, the Bay of Biscay up at the top. And so, of course, the weather comes right off of the ocean here. By the way, as you can see on the larger map, then of the area, there are several subzones to the Rias Baixas. Uh, not that you really need to worry about that at all, but you see almost like fjords going in here. In fact, this area produces much of the seafood that is eaten in Europe. So it really is sort of amazing to, to see all of this and this area there. So really just a beautiful area in green Spain. Um, this is, um, you know, a picture from the seashore. It's just, it's so beautiful. In fact, you just really want to go. And also it is right below Santiago de Compostela. You may know about taking sort of the pilgrim's route. Um, Santiago, uh, St. James, was uh, supposedly buried there in Santiago de Compostela. And so pilgrims in the Middle Ages would walk uh, the, uh, the, the whole way, typically from France and other countries in Europe uh, across northern Spain to Santiago. And then they would get their the pilgrims uh, shell that in fact show that they were a pilgrim. And so this is that beautiful area of green Spain. I mean, look at the seacoast and this just beautiful picture. And the vineyards literally go right down to the water. So it just, it really is quite, quite lovely. I've never made it to the Rio Spicious. It would be really fun to go to see. So just absolutely beautiful uh, in that area there. Uh, the grape is Albarino. Um, and you know what's really neat? I really like talking to the students about this in class, is that so many wines that no one ever heard of 20 years ago are suddenly 
fairly common. And Al Barino is one of them. 20 years ago, there were none. And now you can very often find three or four at a good wine shop. And so that really works very, very, you know, I mean, it's really very easy to find those wines. And so Al Barino is one of that. I really like this picture because you can see that old vineyard there in the back. So that, I thought that was really uh, a very nice picture of that. This is, in fact, the um, the uh, vineyards uh, where the grapes come from, uh, from uh, De San, uh, Barrio de San Campo. So beautiful, beautiful place there. Uh, this is the uh, the vineyard or the winery, the one of the winery buildings. So uh, really, really nice. Some place that is just, just beautiful. Um, they say they have, of course, have high altitude vineyards, um, you know, several hundred feet above sea level. Uh, not, obviously not the ones that we saw in the pictures right at sea level. Uh, they had harvest them in small crates so that they don't want any of the skins to break on the grapes so that they will be intact when they finally do the pressing. Uh, cold maceration, so they actually give the wine, they do a pressing and allow the grapes and the, and the, the skins and the juice to sit for a while in the must for a few hours. They don't add any yeast, they actually have cultivated the yeast from their own vineyards and that's what they use. And they say, of course, it matches shell shellfish, oysters, clams, and crab. And they also uh, recommend it for Asian dishes. So, I mean, just what a lovely wine. Really, really nice uh, with that uh, to have. Uh, wine enthusiasts gave it 90 points. Apple, stone fruit, mineral aromas, a touch leasy. Uh, leasy is a little yeasty on the nose. Shows some fullness, white, wild pineapple, nectarine, and citrus flavors cover the full spectrum of flavor. Drink now. This actually comes in from the Trincaro family. Uh, they are of Sutter home fame. And so um, really very interesting one. Lovely, lovely. I know it's early in the game, Emily, but are there any questions? Um, none about, <clears throat> excuse me, this specific wine, Sure. but one kind of about wine in general and it mm -hmm. includes white wines. So, um, somebody says, what is the purpose for different colors of wine bottles? Um, usually they see reds and green bottles and whites and rosé and clear. Is there a reason behind that or just. That's a good question. And they, that's actually a very good question. Green or a colored bottle is typically better for wine because um, you do not want the sunlight. The UV is typically stopped by the glass, but just the sunlight will warm the bottle and can cause some problems in the wine. And so that's why we usually have, you might remember, in fact, um, uh, you know, typically, of course, I just see it in stores. I don't buy them. Uh, Cristal is in a clear bottle, and usually it comes in a yellow plastic to protect it from the sun's light. Uh, and so you really don't want that. With the whites, that's true. You do see a lot more of that. And I think what they're doing is really showing you the color. Rosés are really interesting that way. The rosé we're having this evening is medium colored, I would say. Um, but a lot of rosés, uh, in fact, one I bought today, um, is extremely light in color. And that's because the wines from Tavel in the south of France tend to be that almost, you know, almost skin colored, really pale pink. And so uh, you see a lot of that. And I think they do that because of that. Obviously, you can't put in the light. You would not have in the sunlight. You would not put in a sunny window to show that wine. Uh, but that's usually why. It's actually to protect. They use the color to protect the wine itself. Um, actually, go get It's in a box because uh, I just bought it. There's a box in there and you'll see a white uh, a, a rosé and I'll show you. I'll show everyone the color. Thanks. Perfect. Anyhow. That's all. Um, we do have a question about rosé, but I can wait until we get. Okay, we can certainly do that and go on yeah. to the next wine. Doo, doo, doo. Uh, thank you. Oh, by the way, since in fact we just were tasting wine, the first thing I usually talk about is in fact what's going on in the world of wine. And I've actually seen this number of places now, and it is a bit worrisome. I meant to get in touch with my friend Eric, uh, who is makes sparkling wines in Lodi, but around April 8th, it was 90 degrees in much of California. And a few days later, it was below freezing. 
And so they had a frost event. As you can see on this picture, those grapes are hurting. And if you look very carefully, almost right in the middle of the picture, you can see the flower buds. And so the flower buds sort of right there in the center of the picture. Uh, and you do worry about them being damaged. And so this, in fact, was one thing that they're worried about. April is like this. And so we find this time and time again that these, these are events that are happening. I haven't really heard much. Actually, I'll show you a picture from Marjos, but this was in early April where it got quite cold there. But um, unfortunately, their website was down, and so I couldn't see if they had any problems or if it was early enough so they did not have a problem, in fact, with, uh, with frost uh, there. And I've heard nothing else coming out of Europe about frost this year. Other years, too many other years. It has been, in fact, very, very bad. So that's going on, and they I will check with some people to find out how, if, how badly it's going to be for them. Some areas, I think, got hit fairly hard. And look at this. Talk about the exact opposite. This was on the BBC just a couple of days ago. And if you're interested, you can look up this Slinda Vineyards in Norway. And that is the winemaker. They're, I still can't believe it. They're making wine on a fjord in Norway. And he has 2,700 vines. He has a grape that's mostly uh, the European wine grape, Vinifera. Uh, called Solaris that he uses. But in later on in the um, video, I really think he was planting both Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It, it's shocking to see that. Uh, and it really, so it's fascinating. You know, you can look it up quite easily as I did uh, for that vineyard and find out. But it's like, wow, I, I would have never dreamed that anyone would be making wine in Norway in my lifetime. Uh, I certainly thought later because of climate change, but still, that is truly, truly amazing to see. Finally, I saw this right before I got ready to do the class. Um, certainly one of the most interesting gentlemen in the American wine industry is jean Schwal Boisé. He is married to Gina Gallo. The Boisé family is very prominent in Burgundy. And I've actually been lucky enough to meet him on a couple of occasions. And he is pretty wacko. Uh, but you see him there with uh, Robert Chang of the American Truffle Company. And so they are going to work to grow black truffles in Napa Valley. So I thought that was fairly amazing to think about. So we'll see how that ventures. He is quite the showman and, in fact, has bought a number of really interesting properties in, uh, in Napa and other areas. So those are some of the things that are going on in the world of wine currently with all of that. <laughs> the birds are getting busy. Right, did the next slide not come? wonder where it went to. Beg your pardon? Hmm. The slide is missing. It's really very strange because I know I have it. Actually, what I'll do, since I don't have it, I don't think I, I don't think I have it misplaced. No, I don't. How odd that doesn't come up. Anyway, this is the wine. We're going to do wine number two. And so, as you can see, it is the Cambria Catherine's Vineyard 2019 Chardonnay. For some reason, that that slide is black. Oh, very good. Uh, and so you can see this, the Santa Maria Valley, uh, there in the south. So let's try this wine. Beautiful color. Uh, we'll talk about the Santa Maria Valley, which in fact is fairly far to the south, um, uh, as we will see. In fact, not far from Monterey. Um, interesting place because the reason that we grow great grapes in California is the presence of a cold ocean. And you know that Napa and Sonoma, Napa especially for the most part, goes north-south. And so the wind has to come in across the San Francisco Bay, then goes north. Well, in the Santa Maria, San Inez Valley, it comes straight up the river. And so it literally gets warmer, a, like a degree a mile as you go up. So if you are close to the ocean, you are growing Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Riesling. And as you go further away, that is, is what happens with this. Beautiful golden color, absolutely clear. Lovely wine, almost has a little bit of a greenish highlights to it. It's a beautiful nose. The thing I like about it is obviously you have that butteriness from the oak. 
but it's far from overpowering. There's almost a little uh, creme brulee in there also, that sort of, you know, butterscotch or burnt sugar. But it certainly does not overpower the wine because there's wonderful fruit in there. Oh, probably like baked pears, maybe some apple. Oh, it's that's pretty, really lovely wine. And of course, if you taste this wine, mm. it's crisp. And that's so important to me in a Chardonnay because sometimes they get a little too creamy and almost cloying in all of this. And so they really have all, you know, really beautiful flavors. Mm. And then just opens up. It's buttery. <laughs> it's a little funny. It almost reminds me of corn on the cob, you know, because it has that butter and that sort of that flavor, that aroma that's there. That's really interesting uh, that it, it would have that, you know, especially if you did it on the grill. You know, it's like, wow, wow this might be my go to drink this summer. Uh, so it's just a, amazing, wonderful flavors in this wine. Just really, really nice. Fair amount of alcohol. I'll ask again, 14 maybe? I should have written some of these things down. But I have a feeling there's a decent amount of alcohol in there. Oh, just lovely. 14? God, I'm good. 14.1. A 14.1. Oh, I was off. <laughs> uh, isn't that lovely? I mean, really. And it's also a little bit, it was a little fruit salad -y also. Gee, that's nice. Beautiful wine. Beautiful wine. And the wonderful thing is it's not break the bank expensive. I mean, for a wine of this quality, that is just amazing. Really, really nice. Uh, let's look at this wine. Thank you. I don't know whether this is, in fact, it gives you an idea. It's in Santa Barbara County. So down there between San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and you can see the river coming in. This is the area that you see right there, right next to Bien Nacido, which is a very famous vineyard. Um, these are, in fact, the vineyards of uh, of the um, er of the winery, Cambria, excuse me. And um, you can see they've planted a lot of Chardonnay. They have a lot of Pinot Noir. Uh, and they grab a little bit of Viognier and a little bit of Syrah. In fact, very, very little in uh, in the area uh, there. Uh, this is this winery is completely run by women. Uh, in fact, um, you know what the funny thing is, though? This is a beautiful, again, you look at those hills, you see this beautiful expanse of vineyard area. The only thing that you never see, and I've used or I've tried to see this in Cambria, you never see a picture of the winery. This is the most you ever see of the winery. I have no idea why. I have searched diligently through the internet to find something. And usually that's it. That's all you ever get to see. So I always find that sort of funny to that it is that way because it's obviously everything else is just beautiful. Um, it's completely run by women. And the owner, in fact, from many, many years ago is Barbara Banky. Barbara Banky was married to Jess Jackson. And of course, it's Kendall Jackson. And um, Jess Jackson passed away now a number of years ago. I bet, ooh, time flies, maybe eight years or more. And she, not only did she take over, but she has done a sterling job of running the company expanded it, um, has just just done an amazing job. They're also very environmentally aware and they, they're they very strong about sustainability. Really very, very good. So she is, of course, was married to Jess uh, and runs the entire Kendall Jackson empire. Uh, this is her daughter, Catherine, who is the proprietor. And, and there is a, another daughter who also works there. Uh, both of them, of course, Barbara's daughters. Barbara's are just daughters. And so they, the whole place, in fact, is run by women. And they do an amazing job. I find their wines to be very, very good and very reasonably priced. And so uh, Cambria is almost always a good 
bet for a good wine. There's simply no question about that. Again, another picture. Absolutely just gorgeous and nice, cool climate, not that far from uh, the ocean. And so they get all of that nice, cool air there. Another picture of the vineyards uh, that they had there. It's 100% Chardonnay. Um, it has three different clones. Uh, I'm not sure what clone four is. I should have looked that up, but 80% old vine clone clone four. But then the additional clones are Wenty. Uh, Wenty clone, uh, Wenty winery was one of the first to plant a lot of Chardonnay. And so many, many people went and got Budwood there to start their vineyard from the Wenty clone. And then clone 76 and 96. Uh, alcohol 14.1. Uh, wine making whole cluster press. They actually put it in in whole cluster. S interesting though, seventy five percent is barrel fermented and twenty five percent is stainless steel. So it's not all oak, and you can sort of tell it's not that heavy in the oak. Obviously, the oak is there, but it's not too much. Also, the other interesting thing is seventy five percent of the wine goes through malolactic fermentation. Now, in a nutshell, you start with malic acid, which is very common in cool climate grapes, and a, a a bacteria changes it into lactic acid, which is the acid in milk. So we go from the acid in apples to the acid in milk, which is much softer. And all reds go through ML, which we typically call it. It's a lot easier than saying malolactic fermentation each time. So most of them go through ML, but very few whites do. Only Chardonnay is one that is very often done in this way. And they only do two thirds of it or 75%, excuse me, three quarters. And so the other 25% will be fresher and will not have that. And so it gives them some acid to work on. They also age for Sir Lee, meaning that they allow some of the yeast to remain in the barrel. So as they break down, they give the creaminess that you find in this wine. And then besides that, it's a 20% new French oak. And so obviously the rest of it has been used at least once or twice through that. So this is the, the various compositions of this wine. Absolutely lovely wine. Oh yeah, it's just so pretty. What did people think of it? Vinus gave it 94 points. Catherine's Vineyard is fabulous. Rich and ample. The Catherine offers dimen a striking dimension to play off mid-weight structure. They say lemon, confit, tangerine oil, spice, and tropical accents. I certainly get the tropical accents. All meld together effortlessly. Catches a blend of various parcels and clones across the state. Classic Santa Maria Chardonnay hits all the right notes. 93 from um, uh, Wine Enthusiast. And they give credit to... The female winemaker, Jill Russell, um, does wonders with widely available wine. They say Meyer lemon, sea salt, roasted peaches on the nose, leading into pan-seared apple, more salt and a touch of warm butter on the palate. Edler's Choice. 91 for the spectator, plush and well-spiced, creamy palate, ripe apple, peach pastry. The finish is loaded with buttered toast, accents that glide across the palate. Drink now through 2024. Uh, and Wilfred Wong, who I always like in wine.com, uh, gave it 90, layered and smooth. Aromas and dried spices, ripe apples, hints of oak. Enjoy it with grilled halibut. As, and he tasted it, in fact, a year ago. Beautiful wine. And interesting. And it, you know, I would imagine that these, um, as you see, Wilfred Wong, um, was done a number of months ago. And so I really think you see some evolution in the bottle that it has changed from what they had tasted, you know, I really do feel that the, the butter has, in fact, come a bit more to the fore uh, in the past year. That would be my guess. <sighs> Questions, Emily? Yep, we have a couple. Um, before I ask the questions, I did want to mention um, to everyone watching that our Central Florida alumni chapter is hosting a post wine tasting discussion on Zoom. Um, it's hosted by the Central Florida chapter, but anybody joining in is welcome to attend. So if you are interested in attending and um, talking more about the wines you've tasted to, that you have tasted and will be tasting tonight, or just want to talk about fun Miami memories and connect with other alumni via Zoom, um, drop your email in the ask a question button and let me know 
that you would like the Zoom link and I can send that to you. Um, all right. And to the questions, somebody, Adam said, this Chardonnay is amazing. What makes this one so much smoother than some of the more tart ones I've tasted? Well, I think actually the, a very good question. Uh, two things. Uh, one is the uh, the use of Sir Lee uh, aging. And so that gives it a creaminess thanks to the nine months on the yeast. And so that will give it a bit more of a creamy texture. Uh, I think another part of the creaminess is the 75% malolactic fermentation, because when you change malic acid to lactic acid, it makes the wine softer and creamier also. So I would think that those two factors more than anything else. The other thing is these grapes are grown in a relatively cool climate. And so they also have a nice, a nice acidity, but not too much. And so they really have done a beautiful job of balancing it out. So I think that's, those are the major factors. And one more about Chardonnay. Um, what do you recommend for a creamy, oaky Chardonnay? Rombauer comes to mind right away. Uh, Rombauer has always sort of been the flagship when it comes to that. And at the same time, I don't think over oaked, um, uh, th but they handle the oak probably as well or better than practically anyone that I'm familiar with. Um, I'll be honest, I don't drink a lot of, especially oaky Chardonnays. Uh, this is beautiful. I, I prefer um, Chardonnays with less oak and more acid. Um, obviously, I mean, this is beautiful. There's no question about that. But um, if I'm going to drink a Chardonnay, I'll probably drink a white burgundy. Uh, and not because, oh, it's a white burgundy. It's just because it's typically crisper and leaner and brighter. And so as a food wine, they tend to go very well. But this, you know, this would be a no-brainer with lobster. This would be a no-brainer with any kind of cream sauce. I can certainly see doing it with chicken. Uh, you know, you could certainly do it with pasta primavera since it's spring. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you could do very, very nicely with this wine. Just lovely. Great. Thank you. That's all we have for right Great. now. Excellent. So I need, my, yeah, there we go. So wine number three, this is, uh, as you see on your screen, and hopefully that you managed to get this, La Reserve de Malarctic. Uh, it is from Pesac Leonian, uh, which is in Bordeaux, in fact, quite close to the city of Bordeaux. Uh, and so let's try this wine. First of all, as you saw there, you can see the ship. Have the fun about doing these, uh, you know, when I start, you know, doing these and, and looking into this, you know, the history of some of these places is just amazing. Uh, just just absolutely amazing in there. Uh, by the way, this, I think that's a Carolina Wren, and then that's that's a that's a very, very loud nuthatch. Gee, crazy birds tonight. This is not a problem I usually have when I'm tasting wine, at least in the house in there. But so and so the ship is in fact for um, one of the owners who was a governor in a number of French colonies across the Atlantic. And so that's why the ship is on the front of this. This is their second label. Again, I don't think it's because I'm outside, but this does certainly have green notes to it. There's no question that that's yellow, which with really an amazing tinge of green to that wine. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all, uh, with that sort of green tinge that you have there. And if you swirl and smell this wine. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just disgusting how much I like this wine. I mean, he just smells it's like, oh, that's just so nice. I remember uh, when I, I took a wines course at Penn State, and I remember that Bob Beeman, who taught the course, 
uh, he opened a bottle of Chateau Talbot, a very, very good Bordeaux. And I can still remember him standing up there in front of the class and after he poured it and so he put it to his nose and he said to the students, he goes, um, excuse me, I'll need a minute. <laughs> and so that's how I feel with this wine. It's just like, ah, you know, nothing else exists except you and the wine when you smell something that is this wonderful. Fresh, uh, you know, flowery green apples and oh yeah flowers you know i mean i i think it reminds me of almost of you know after you you know done like a little bit of mowing through a field or something dang wonderful citrus a little lime that wine is <laughs> it's just gorgeous it really hits all the buttons for me a little yeah lime um you know, uh, not really mint, but the herbalness, just gorgeous. And I haven't even tasted it. Have you taste this wine? <laughs> mm. Smooth. Wonderful acidity, but not too much. Creaminess on the palate, again. A little bit of oak everything beautifully integrated just mm, such a wonderful flavor mm, nice herbal notes come out of that wine it is just beautiful and remember this is their second label the full-on malartic la gravier uh is uh obviously a lot more expensive and needs a lot more time in the bottle uh but also absolutely amazing wine and interestingly enough there this wine comes from as you'll see in a moment from Pesac Leonian which is right south of Bordeaux and the whole area used to be called Grave which is just French for gravel and the people in Pesac is a town Leonian is a town and so uh, it's probably, I think, in the 50s, they basically said to everybody, mm, we make better wine than the rest of Grav. And to tell you the truth, they were right. And so consequently, they separated themselves. They made themselves a, a, a separate um, AOC, in other words, a delimited area. And so this is where the best white Graves come from. But they also make reds there. In fact, Malartic La Grivier, if I remember rightly, is... 58 hectares and a hectare is 2.4 acres and only seven hectares are white and the other than like 51 hectares or something i may not that exactly right are red um but they in fact get a higher price for their white uh first label than they do for their second their, their second first label beautiful let me tell you a little bit about this wine or show you some things from it this is also a wine that comes out a little saline in the finish. Now, it's not that there's salt in the wine, but it just has minerals that give you a salty feeling in the wine that you're getting there. So let's look at this wine. It is from Bordeaux. And in fact, as you see in the blue uh, right there, uh, I guess you can see the pointer, uh, Pesac Leonian. And so just south of the city, in fact, some of these places are, are literally in the suburbs. You know, because obviously Bordeaux, as every city has, it grows. And so consequently, uh, for example, uh, Chateau Pepe Clément, which is uh, a second growth, it is in the suburbs. There are buildings around the vineyards. It's just strange to see, but it is the way it is. And and Malartic Le Gravier is, to a great extent, along the same way. So that's where it is, just south of the city of Bordeaux. It's not liking me. I have another blank black screen, black slide. Let's see if I go back. That's slide 26. Slide 27 is black. Oh well.
Are you there, Jack? Or are you frozen? Jack is having some minor technical difficulties, so we will return um, to live programming shortly. He is getting on a different computer. Um, so just enjoy the wine that you are currently tasting, and he will be back on as soon as possible. Again, if you are interested in um, discussing the wines we've tasted tonight and will continue to taste when we get Jack back, um, you can join the Central Florida Alumni Chapter as they host a Zoom um, to discuss the wines we're tasting and also some of our favorite Miami memories. Um, go ahead and if you want to join, you can put your name um, and email in the ask, using the Ask a Question button and I will send you a Zoom link. Otherwise, we will return um, shortly as soon as we get Jack back on um, and just enjoy the wines we've tasted so far. Thank you. <laughs> all right you're back jack <laughs> you, and, um, and we're done I've, I've, we're done i've drunk all the wine <laughs> <laughs>
Um, you will I need apologize. to share to add your slides again. Um, okay. Which you can do by hitting the share button, slides, and then you should have them already uploaded. There you go. You might just need to find uh, yes, your spot. Little, Actually, I can get you there. Fast moving. Luckily, it moves very fast. Okay, yes. Still blank. That slide is still black. <laughs> I wonder why. It's so weird. Oh, yeah. full screen. Okay, we're back in action. We're back Good in job. action. I I do apologize. You know, in doing this and being here, of course, we thought we had everything done, except that I hadn't um, plugged the computer back in. We plugged in the lights. We plugged in everything else and forgot the computer. Um, I What can I say? You know, my technical help sucks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're back to it. <laughs> so as you can see, we did that. And there's a, a black slide. Uh, but this is their humble abode. This is, in fact, Melartic La Gravier. Just beautiful, isn't it? And, you know, we talk about stories. And, of course, the 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 property itself has a long history, but the Bonnet family bought it not very long ago and they had no idea. Uh, they had never done anything with wine and here, but they poured money into it and they were passionate about it. They have increased the acreage. And so you now have probably one of the, one of the best producers in Bordeaux, certainly when it comes to whites and their reds are very, very good also. Uh, here, of course, the beautiful vineyards. You can see the gravelly soil that is there below. Um, the grapes, as we will talk about, are, in fact, typically a blend, uh, as this is, of Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc, typically with some others also. Here, of course, is picking at Melartic La Gravier that I pulled off of the net today so that you so could see what the vineyards look like in the fall as they're being picked. Uh, and very modern. This uh, uh, obviously their large um, uh, areas or their large tanks uh, of wood, where they do. I am sure the reds, which they have a lot more reds than they do whites. Um, two different grapes, as you can see. It's eighty percent Sauvignon. It is twenty percent Semillon. Uh, you can see that the Sauvignon Blanc was harvested first, uh, and then the Semillon. Um, there you see their total area is 53 hectares, but the area in white is only seven hectares. So I'll, most of it is red, very gravelly. They talk about the what is there, uh, close density, um, uh, slow fermentation. Uh, it spends, and this is why this wine has this wonderful creaminess on the leaves for 10 months. The um, uh, the consultant is Michel Roland, probably one of the most famous consultants, in fact, certainly the most famous consultant in Bordeaux. And so he has had a lot to do with this. And they are uh, also a very high level of, of sustainability and biodiversity. So very, very neat. And what did they think of it? Wine enthusiasts gave it 92 points. Wine is a good mix of herbal freeness and spice from wood aging, freshness, hints of green fruits, touches of apricots, enriched with a creamy texture. Um, and at 90 from the Wine Cellar Insider, better from the bottle than the barrel, showing great waxy lemon flower and green apple character, elegant, fresh, and vibrant. No question. With sweet yellow citrus and mildly honeyed finish, this is ready for prime time drinking. While you wait for the Grand Vin, in other words, the just the straight Malartic La Gravier Blanc, to come around. 90 points from the Wine Cellar Insider. Beautiful wine. Beautiful wine. Again, I apologize. Any questions, Emily? Yeah, so we did have one come in. Somebody wants to know, what makes this wine more expensive than the others that we are sampling? Good question. One is where it's from. It's from Bordeaux. It is um, from a very good producer. And so that is part of it. Also, I am sure the care that they take in the production of the wines and caring for the vines is also more labor intensive, but I'll be honest. I mean, there are wines that sell for a thousand dollars 
And the same as there are many things that sell for ridiculous prices. It's supply and demand. It is the cachet that you have for owning it. Uh, many things like that. And I mean, this wine is, is, is really lovely. It's, it's interesting. You know, when you look at the point scores and then it comes down to personal preference because Obviously, I liked all the wines. I would not pick these wines if I did not like them. Um, but if I had decided the three that I was going to drink, I would drink the Malartic Le Gravier. There's simply no question about it. That would be my first choice. I have no problem drinking any of the three, but that wine is, to me, just so expressive, so beautiful that, you know, to spend $40 on a bottle of wine, I don't do a whole lot, and I would spend $40 on that wine. Uh, for that reason, I really think it is a you know, beautiful expression of what it is. Um, and we actually, we'll talk a little bit more about white Bordeaux. Anything else? Yeah. One other question. Sure. Um, and kind of in the spirit of Earth Day and spring, um, you mentioned that Catherine's Vineyard Winery is environmentally aware. Um, are more, do you know of more wineries? Are they starting to become more environmentally aware? Um or is that one of the only ones you know of that is doing that? Actually, this is this has always been a, a, a bit of a problem for me because one of and I you know one of one of the terms that is bandied about a lot now in you know especially you know among for the most part a small percentage of the wine community is this idea of natural wines. Because I sit there going, well, what's an unnatural wine? I mean, you know, I mean, all wines are natural. I, you know, obviously there are some that are done more by committee and for certain flavor profiles that they work for, where most of the people who I feel make wine are passionate about making wine, are passionate about the things they do. And especially this is where they live. They're not going to spray a lot of pesticides on themselves and their families. They're not going to do those things. And so I have always felt, and of course there's always back and forth, but I've always felt that for the most part, wine producers are environmentally conscious as a group because they have to be. They really have no choice. And so, and so I start from there. But at the same time, more and more producers are, you know, not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. One of the big things, which was really interesting, there was a, I was just reading about a, a, a very high end tasting. And one of the things that they did was they gave the weight of the bottles for each of the wines, because that is the bottle is one of the major environmental problems with wine. And so often they will make a bottle. I'm, and I've had many bottles of wine. Well, not many. But certainly I've lifted them, though, that empty are heavier than many bottles of wine that are full. I was really pleased to see a rosé. In fact, I'd love to find a bottle. Moet Hennessy just came out with a rosé that is in plastic. Not only is it in plastic, uh, which uh, obviously has its own environmental problems, but is thin, so it takes up a lot less room. I mean, think of a bottle. You know, when you have to have a bottle and you put 12 in a case, you have a lot of empty space in between those round bottles. And so this is why, you know, as long as the quality gets better and better for wine in a bag, basically in a box, um, environmentally, that's very good. Um, one thing I didn't mention, and I should have added, because this happened a few months ago, Tablas Creek, that makes wonderful wines. They, in fact, sold their rosé in a three-liter box. And that wine was, if I'm not mistaken, $85 for a three-liter box. But that's the equivalent of four bottles. And if you bought four bottles of that rosé, it would cost you $112. So you're actually saving money and you are doing the environmentally right thing. So I really do feel, because they have to be in some ways too, that that wineries are very environmentally conscious as a group. You'll always have bad apples. But for the most part, I really do think that they do a good job because they have to. You know, they're stewards of the land. And if they screw it up, 
then they're they're screwed themselves. And so I don't, you know, I think that's what they do. Good question. Okay, one more um, sure. that has to do with this wine. So a couple people said that they weren't able to find the Malartic, so they substituted it with some brand of Chateau. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm saying either of those correct, so I apologize. Chateau was fine. Um, <laughs> but, Malartic was fine. You so they want to know how it might compare to the wine that they're drinking. Uh, do you know which Chateau? Somebody said, oh boy, here we go. Okay, <laughs> Chateau Palette. And Chateau Laver Laveria Haubriand. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Laveria Did you did that translate? Laveria Haubriand. I understood. Okay, good. And so, yes, um, that's interesting. And without knowing the vintage and without knowing the wines, uh, obviously, actually, let me answer the question by going to the next slide. White Bordeaux's, I decided to give a little bit of just a, a, a slight or very short uh, uh, dissertation or just a little uh, the thing about White Bordeaux's, what you're drinking. White Bordeaux's are almost always blends, and they're blends of Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc and occasionally Muscadel. Muscadel is used in very small amounts because it's very aromatic, but you will often find it. There are two basically camps or two distinctions between white Bordeaux. You can, of course, have the the sweet white Bordeaux. Sauternes, Cadillac, Montpazillac. There's a number of actually sweet white Bordeaux that are made. But, of course, what we're having now are the dry Bordeaux. And, and so they will be varying amounts of Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc um, in them, like this one is 80% Sauvignon Blanc, 20% Semillon. Interesting, the sweet ones tend to be more Semillon than Sauvignon Blanc as a general rule in all of this. Um, as you can see in Bordeaux, 45% of the white grapes are Semillon, 43% are Sauvignon Blanc, and then 5% Muscadel, and then 7%, they grow a little Pinot Gris. They actually have four or five different grape varieties that they are, in fact, allowed to grow. All of this is under definite rules and rules for all of this. I will tell you flat out that some of the best bargains that you can get in wine are white Bordeaux. There are many, uh, for example, I bought a wine today called La Moda O. I have used it in class a number of times. This wine was all of $11.95 and it is usually, it will not have the quality, it won't have the depth of the Malartic Le Gravier that we drank now, but it is perfectly fine for everyday drinking, and at that price, why not? And because he, probably about 90% of all Bordeaux is red, and so because of that, you can find a lot of really good values in white Bordeaux. Now, not saying, you know, the straight Malartic Le Gravier in front of the main, the Blanc, I think it's not $100 a bottle. And you can find uh, Smith O' Lafitte makes amazing white Bordeaux, but they are also not cheap at all. And so you will find those, but those are up there actually. Chateau Aubriand makes a white, it's $1,000 a bottle. I haven't tasted it. Uh, Le Mission also makes an excellent one. Um, Mouton makes, I uh, think of Mouton, makes Pavillon Blanc, $1,000 a bottle. Crazy um, prices. And so you will find those. But otherwise, white Bordeaux can be really, really good buys. And so I would recommend uh, Greville Lacoste, uh, La Moda O. Uh, I can think of a number of them that are, you know, and again, a little more expensive, Chateau La Louvier. Chateau Carbonneau, uh, wonderful wines. And so if you really like white wines and something that's great for the summer but has a real nice depth of flavor, white Bordeaux are certainly one of the ways to go. Okay? I know that was a little long-winded, but that is certainly how I feel about white Bordeaux. Very, very nice wines. Great. That's okay. all we have for right now. Great. Let's continue then. Our next wine is a rosé. This is Regaleale uh, from Sicily. 
Uh, and as you can see on the label, this wine is from the grape Norella Mascalesi, which is that and Norella Capuccio are the two main grapes that you will find uh, in Sicily that are used, especially on Mount Etna, uh, et cetera. So let's taste this wine. First of all, beautiful color, nice, bright, sort of orangey pink, not too dark. Where the white? Where the other one bottle go? Am I crazy? No, the one I was showing you. Yeah, <laughs> just just a minute. Let's suddenly look for it. I wanted to show you just to in comparison. This is a bottle that I bought today, um, and it is a rosé. It's from 2020, but this is in fact from the uh, south of France. And all they say is grown and vinted in France, so it must be actually it's a Bordeaux, Appellation Bordeaux Protégée. So, uh, oh, so it's an I, it's an IGT from. From there, how oh, interesting! But uh, the color, and I'll admit, it was cheap, and so that's why I picked it up because I thought, oh, it'll be fun to try. Um, and I, this is the kind of stuff I'll be honest that drives me crazy. For example, it says it's vegan. Well, of course it's vegan. I mean, you know, I mean, no cows were slaughtered to make this wine. You know, it's just blows my mind sometimes when people do those kinds of things. That shows you the color. I haven't tried it yet, so I can't tell you how it tastes. But we will taste this one. And I have tasted this one. And it's just in the in the color just great. I mean, it really is. It's it's a sunset. I mean, it really just has that beautiful color of sort of pinks and golds. Really lovely. If you throw and smell this wine. Ah, oh, just just so pleasant soft. You know, it's funny, when I was teaching last night, a number of the wines said about strawberries. I'm like, I don't get it. Now I get it. This smells of strawberries. It really has a wonderful strawberry aroma there. Oh, yeah. Strawberries, maybe a little raspberry. So pretty. Just so pretty. And of course, we taste this wine. Mm. What's not to like? It's clean. Maybe not so much. Well, strawberries, but almost strawberry jam more because it really sort of has a jammy character to it, but certainly still strawberries. I don't really get a lot of cherries, maybe other berries, maybe raspberries more. But yeah, that and strawberries, very, very berry-like. Easy drinking, really pretty. Oh, yeah. It's interesting. <clears throat> it is fun to share this wine, and I hope those of you who were able to find this wine. Um, I will show you some pictures of the of the area, but they brought in just the first uh, wines from this portfolio into Ohio. And that's, of course, always a problem. And so, uh, and every one of them was like, uh, and of course, my question was right away. It's like, oh, okay, this is a rosé, Norella Mascalesi. Where's the red? Because that's what most of them are made. Well, they haven't brought that into the state yet. It's like, well, you tell me when you do, because I'm sure it's going to be very, very tasty. Lovely wine. Lovely wine. A little bit about this wine. Let's go to the slides. This is Sicily. Um, we will talk. And in fact, actually, they own vineyards now. This estate, and it certainly is an estate, is quite large and basically in the middle of nowhere. Uh, in fact, if you look on this map, Basically, between the blue blob and the purple blob is where they are. And they started this in literally like 1830, where the family bought this and, in fact, began developing it. And they've grown any number of things on it. They didn't really go into grapes until later. And then the current 
the current member of the family who's basically running the operation with the backing of the rest of the family has now bought vineyards in, I think, five different areas in Sicily. And so they have an entire portfolio of wines now that they are um, that they are making. And hopefully we will see more of them in uh, here in Ohio. Um, so that's Sicily. Um, typically, this is another great example. 20 years ago, if you drank anything from Sicily, it was Marsala. And if you drank Marsala, you definitely didn't drink Marsala because you cooked with it. And so because a lot of Marsala was also industrial and wasn't very good, that is also changing. Um, today, so many Sicilian wines, especially from Mount Etna, have become the darlings of sommeliers. This is uh, the, um, uh, the home uh, that they have uh, in the center of this huge property. Beautiful pictures. You know, again, I spent some time looking to see what they had and just from various people who had visited, just absolutely beautiful countryside, literally in the middle of nowhere. And I'd be happy to go there for a while. It is just looks just so lovely. Uh, it's 100% Norella Mascalese. It's all done in stainless steel. 15 days of alcoholic fermentation, cool fermentation, 57 degrees. They do a cold soak. That's how they get the color into the wine. So um, 12 hours. So they literally take the Nerola Mascalese, which is a red grape. They throw it in. They crush it. They allow the skins to remain in the juice as the whole must for 12 hours. And then they press it. And so now they've got this pink wine that they now make like a white wine, cool fermentation, everything the way that they do this. Um, it, uh, that's interesting. It goes through partial ML. And so part of it does go through malolactic fermentation. Um, just stainless steel, only aged in the bottle for three months because this is meant to be drunk young and delicious. And it is. It's both. Another good hint. This is 2020. And the 2021 rosés are coming out. And often you will find the 2020 wines for a song because the next vintage is coming in. Most people want to drink the youngest wine. And so they will be selling off the wine they didn't sell last year. And in many cases, I you can do what I do. Buy a bottle, take it home, drink it, some people might try it in the car. I don't recommend that. Uh, and see if you like it. And then go back and buy more. Because you can sometimes find some great buys on last year's rosés. And some rosés will certainly last three to five years. Not all of them. They're meant to be drunk young. But you can find some really good buys that way. So just a little, little bit of a hint. Mm. And to give you an example, this is lovely. It's pleasant. It has nowhere near the depth and the quality and the complexity that the that the previous wine had. And that's fine. It is what they are, what they are. And, and to enjoy them for what they are is, I think, the important thing in drinking wine. Certainly, certainly is for me. You know, I have no problem tasting that wine and having it. This got 89 points from the enthusiast. Savory and refreshing. Lovely risotto has aromas of rose and wild berry. Shows its Sicilian roots. The bright palate finishes crushed raspberry, tart cherry, Mediterranean herb, and star anise be, before a saline finish. Tangy acidity gives it a clean, quenching finish. And there's no question. It really is lovely. The wine is called La Rose. And I was hoping, but no one got back in touch with me, but I did try early this morning. So they were sort of getting to the end of the day in Italy. Um, they say, and I only read this, I saw no pictures, which is why I can't show you one, that they have planted thousands of roses on the estate. And being a person who loves plants and flowers, I wanted to see that. So I have written them. And so maybe, maybe we'll post that later if I actually do get pictures of the roses on the wonderful estate that is there. Um, it's a Tasca La, La, La Merita. I don't have it right in front of me, so I cannot tell you, but that's the name of the entire estate that is there. Okay. Questions, Emily? Well, I've already done a pretty bad job at pronouncing things tonight, so I might as well just go ahead with this question. That's right. 
Um, someone said, I think provincial rosés are the most familiar rosés to us. Would you mind comparing and contrasting to the Italian rosé? Good. That's a good question. I think, obviously, depending on the producer, you will find differences. But a Provençal, in other words, a, a rosé from Provence or Tavel, um, is typically, I think, a little drier than this wine. Um, I think a little lighter than this wine. This wine has a little bit more weight. We really, and that's one of the wonderful things about um, uh, Southern French rosés. We really expect them to be, you know, almost ethereal. They're very light. They do not, you know, they they just sort of glide over your palate. And because it's a war, it's a really hot climate. You're drinking on a warm day. You want something that's going to be really light and refreshing. And this is both, but it has a little bit more weight and depth to it. So I would think more than anything else that that would be obviously it's a generalization, the difference between this rosé or actually a lot of Italian rosés, now that I think of a few that I've had, uh, and uh, the ones from Provence. Great. And that's all we have for right now. Excellent. Let's continue on then. This is the Niner uh, uh, Wine Estate. This is their Boot Jack Red. I didn't buy it because it was Boot Jack. I didn't actually think about that until now. Screw cap. I'm not complaining. Um, it's from Paso Robles. Dark. Um, has a good red color. A real bright red. Almost a very sort of jammy red uh, there. Let me find, well, you can't see it there, but yeah, a very sort of jammy red, uh, fairly dark, but you can see through it. And if you swirl, oh yeah, so nice purple highlights I can see as I'm swirling this wine. Mm, bright, uh, spicy, almost a little cinnamon. Mm, so nice. Yeah. Really spicy, really a lot of nice jammy fruit. And if you taste this wine. Soft. There's tannins there, but not a lot. I mean, you really are getting a tremendous amount of really, really juicy fruit to that. What is the alcohol? Did you see? Just curious. I'm thinking relatively high. Oh, really? Not bad at all. Seems, I'll be honest, seems higher. I feel a little bit more, you know, on the palate in, you know, in my throat uh, with that. But still, really fresh jammy really clean wonderful dark fruits we're talking plums and elderberries and really nice spiciness to that wine a good barbecue wine you know right away i'm thinking oh because because it has enough oomph to stand up to the smokiness if you're barbecuing something. But I would have no problem doing this with a barbecue sauce. I think that it would stand up very nicely because it has the edge of tannins. It has tons of fruit, uh, enough acidity to go against, especially if there's sort of a tomato weed barbecue sauce uh, there. So I really think that that would be very, very nice. I'll be honest, you know, This is probably not a wine that I would buy, but it is. But I, uh, but I wanted to. I thought it was a good exploration, and to show you. I mean, uh, because obviously all of these wines exist, and they can. They are, in fact, very, very good. Um, and so, uh, really, you know, that sweet finish. Now, that's not sugar. That's all fruit um, there. 
And and really, so it's a. Uh, I really do appreciate this wine. It probably just would not be the first wine I would buy to drink. But I thought, you know, that's what makes wine tasting fun and makes it interesting to try things for that reason. Yeah, really nice. It's a crazy wine. Let me show you a few slides. Uh, it is the Niner, as they said, Bootjack Red. This is where it's from, Paso Robles. And so you see it's a little bit north of the Santa Maria, in fact, where the Catherine's Vineyard, where the Cambria came from. So it's there in the north. Um, Paso, uh, as it's typically just called, uh, mm -hmm. has become, um, it's a fairly warm area, and they make a lot of reds and a lot of red blends. Uh, I haven't talked to, fact, actually, Shide Vineyards that's there, one of my um, one of the uh, Miami alum uh, actually now works for them, and there are a few people. And so he's down there in at Paso. Uh, I thought I would sort of zoom in to show you the city. It's a little tough to find, but if you actually look uh, there, because they also have a very nice restaurant there, from what I understand. So there's Niner is down there, sort of to the uh, uh, to the lower uh, left uh, left hand corner uh, there. Uh, not far from Hunt and Pelletier, so sort of the end, I try to do that. So not very far from downtown Paso Robles. Uh, so I thought I would show you that. A number of wineries, Austin Hope uh, is here in Ohio, and so those wines, in fact, are typically fairly expensive uh, if you find them. Uh, and very, you know, Peachy Canyon we often see. Uh, so there's a number of, of good wineries there, and many, many wineries. In fact, further down, Turley is one of sort of the wines uh, in the wine world in California. Uh, this is the winery and part of the vineyards. Quite lovely there in California. Those are some olive trees there to the uh, right. Uh, these are the Niners, Richard and Pam. They bought the, in the 90s. Um, interestingly enough, they were... Um, had the wine through Bronco and now of course have gone independent, but they have built uh, this winery. This is the, uh, a picture of the inside of the winery itself. Uh, and as I said, they have a, from what I understand, at least looking at the menu, a nice restaurant, some, some of the vineyards. I, I don't, I don't know what the plan is in the middle, but they take pictures of it. It really ends up being very heart-shaped. So it's nice to be out on the patio and see that. Uh, winemaker's note, they actually treat each rental. Look at this blend. It is probably one of the craziest blends I have ever seen. It is 31% Cabernet Sauvignon, 21% Malbec, 13% Merlot, 13% Cabernet Franc, 6% Petit Verdot, 6% Carmenier. 4% Syrah, 3% Morvad, 3% Zinfandel, and probably 1% of par partridge in a pear tree. Uh, it's just an amazing a group of wines or that are there on different varietals. And what they do, as you can see, as a foundation, the Cabernet is added for structure, the Malbec for a juicy component, Cabernet Franc for fine tans and lengths, Merlot for subtle fruit and finesse. All the other varietals in the blender accent pieces, each adding spice and different fruit characteristics. The barrels are selected along with the amount of time spent in the barrel through all the individual pieces together in a cohesive way. And they spend, it's literally, you know, a surprise, 48% new French oak. And this wine on average spends 21 months in oak. And you don't really notice the oak. I mean, the oak is there, but it is certainly, it's the fruit that is the component in this wine. Very interesting, very soft, jammy, really nice. Would be a really, this is a good example of a summertime red because it's not heavy and it's not like, oh yeah, you know, I mean, you don't need to have like super heavy food. You have summertime food, stuff off the grill that would be really nice. I could see, gee, even like a barbecued chicken, it would certainly be great with it. Nice wine. Questions, Emily? Yeah. Um, somebody said, do many wines have as many varietals as the bootjack wine? This seems unusual to them. There's no question. This is truly unusual. Um, 
many wines are blends now. And blending is such an important part of winemaking. A um, bunch of examples. Bordeaux, almost every Bordeaux is a blend. Far none. It, it, that's the way it acts. So you, you, you drink a Bordeaux, it has Cabernet Sauvignon, it has Merlot, depending if it's on the other bank, it has um, Cabernet Franc, uh, there may be a little Carmenier Malbec. Uh, when you drink California wines, because California is warmer, you will have, you can have 100% Cabernet Sauvignon for the wines, but not normally. They'll add some Merlot, they'll add some Cabernet Franc. Um, in fact, it's really interesting. Those of you who know the movie Sideways, um, it was basically a love letter to Pinot Noir. But at the same time, the person really, really hit Merlot. I mean, really just, you know, in fact, it was funny because, in fact, the wine that he loved most of all was, in fact, mostly Merlot, uh, Cheval Blanc. And and so that's, it's a, a little crazy uh, with with that. But the amount of Merlot in California, almost shockingly, has has diminished a lot. Well, Merlot is so important as a blending grape and makes delicious wines by itself. All of a sudden, everybody woke up this year and thought, there's not enough Merlot. They need it for the blends and you know, good quality Merlot, and they don't have it. They In Napa, don't hold me to this because I can't, but I want to say that the Merlot over the last 20 years, acreage has decreased like 40%, which is crazy. I had no idea they'd done that. But suddenly, people are scrambling to find Merlot to use in their blends. So the world of wine is always fascinating when it comes to those things. Anything else? Nope, that's it for right now. Great. Let's continue on then. Chateau Marjos. Uh, this is from... Uh, from, uh, in fact, you see at the bottom of the letter, from Pierre Lurton. The Lurton name is absolutely one of the names in Bordeaux. Certainly one of the most important names in Bordeaux. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but we'll have the wine first. This is 2018. This is a young wine. Um, in fact, it's very interesting. And... Um, at Jungles, they uh, showed me today, they just got in, was very, very interesting. I want to say it was a wooden box that had, let's see if I'm, I did my math right, I think 14, a single bottle of 14 different chateaus from Bordeaux of the 2018 vintage. And so what they were selling you was a 2018 gift pack. And so you would buy those wines as I'll be very honest, as I, as I said to the fine wine manager there, it's like, but if I buy the 18s, will I still be alive when I'm supposed to drink them? You know, because these would probably, in fact, they're pretty, obviously pretty good gross. And so, they probably need at least five years and might be better in 10. So, uh, so it's like, uh, yeah, maybe I'll pass. But it was about $600 for, I think, the 14 wines. He said it averaged to $43 a bottle. And the, the names in them, I didn't find tremendously, I didn't know all of them, but it was still an interesting concept that somebody would, in fact, do that. Anyway, enough of this. Let's talk about Marjas. Whoa, beautiful color. Just so nice and red, fairly dark, in fact, fairly opaque, not hold tremendously. Still has some red, some garnet highlights to it. And that nose. Oh, that nose. Just bright red fruits. It has two very French terms, or I think of French terms, I think of Bordeaux. One of them is 
graphite, the sort of lead pencil when you take, and you know, some people may not remember, you know, sharpening a pencil, but that aroma of the wood and the graphite is so found in so many Bordeaux. And it's there. There is no question that the graphite is there. Just lovely. The other term is uh, certainly more for the south of France, and that's garrigue. It's that herbalness also in this wine. Just lovely. Mm. And at the same time, beautiful, bright fruit. Just a lovely, lovely wine. So if you taste this wine... First thing I notice is the mouthfeel. It's creamy. It's soft. It's really lovely. Of course, it finishes then with a nice smack of tannin that is still not heavy, but there certainly is good tannin to this wine. This wine will probably, may actually develop over the next five years and probably last for the next 10 I really feel that there's enough of the tannin and the structure to that wine that it would last very, very well. Um, mm, so tasty. I keep getting that graphite that is so wonderful in that wine. Just, just beautiful. Beautiful fruit. Now coming off with, oh, you know, sort of the black Murillo cherries, almost Amarena. Just beautiful wine. Really nice. And for those of you who were, you know, who were managed to get the Marjos, an amazing deal. I mean, really, really just a wonderful wine. Is that open? Could you open that wine for me just in case I need to do it? Okay. So let me tell you a little bit or show you a little bit about this wine. Pierre Luton, as I mentioned, Pierre Luton, this is his private estate. And this wine, as you know, is not tremendously expensive. And people really do. I think it is just an amazing value because he is the director. He runs Cheval Blanc, which is absolutely one of the best wines on the right bank. And he is also the director of Chateau Ikem which by all accounts is the absolute best sweet sauterne in, obviously in Bordeaux, in the world. And so just an amazing individual by himself. There you go. Let's see. Um, we're back in Bordeaux. In this case, here's the city of Bordeaux. And the winery itself is in the Entre Deux Meurs. Entre de mer between means between two oceans or seas. And that's because, and I should have maybe put a better uh, map in here, the, the, the Gironde, which is the estuary here, breaks up into two rivers. The Garonne goes that way. The um, Dordogne goes this way. And, in, and so, in bet so it's between two rivers. But the words are between two seas. And the reason being is if you are in Bordeaux or if you're in Le Bourne, which is over near saint emilion you will see that, in fact, the water goes up and down with the tides. And so you still are attached to the sea at this point in the rivers. And so it's entre de mer. This is where you can find great bargains. If you have a good producer like Pierre Luton, he makes fantastic wines for truly reasonable prices. And that's why I decided I would do the Marjos uh, tonight. This is the uh, Chateau. Uh, relatively um, not the gigantic one, so a uh, very nice looking place. This is Monsieur Luton and some of the grapes from his uh, vineyard. 
This is a picture, in fact, of the of the vineyards there. Here's another one, in fact, with the harvest at Marjos. Luckily, they, you know, pictures I could find uh, with a, a a lot of with that. Um, I took this picture, in fact, off of Facebook. They have a Facebook page. Who doesn't? Um, and this was April 3rd and frost. And you can see that, in fact, that grape, that vine, that bud was out far enough that it could have been frosted. I have not seen, there was nothing on Facebook or anywhere else um, to find out if they suffered any real frost damage. April 3rd is a bit early. Uh, for them to have frost damage, but that vine seemed to be far enough out uh, so that it would be worrisome. So it was uh, interesting to see. By the way, this wine, um, beautiful. Uh, James Suckling gave it 92 points, and I'm not surprised. Beautiful, precise fruit, blueberry, blackberry character, into full bodied silk tannins. Uh, Vinus Media gave it. Black currant, raspberry aromas, fresh and vibrant glass, plum jam, black olive notes. Uh, the palate is underpinned by fine tans, good substance of crisp cedar tin fish is a pure joy. A must buy from Pierre Luton's home estate. The advocate gave in 92 points. It's 80% Merlot, 10% Cabernet Sauvignon, 10% Cabernet Franc. What you may not realize, because we talk about Cabernet with Bordeaux all the time. We talk about Cabernet Sauvignon with Bordeaux all the time. But yet... Cabernet Sauvignon is only, and I know I'm close to this, like 26% of the grapes that are planted in Bordeaux. Merlot is about 60% of all the grapes planted in Bordeaux are, um, are Merlot. And so you have that, you have the 20-some with um, Cabernet Sauvignon, <clears throat> probably about 10%, if I remember rightly, of Cabernet Franc. And then very, very small amounts of Carmenier or Malbec. And so that's Bordeaux. And so not surprising, this is 8% Merlot, 80% Merlot, 10% Cabernet Sauvignon, 10% Cabernet Franc. A splash of old Malbec, because they do grow some Malbec too. Old barrels used for 25% of the crop. Medium to deep garnet color, opens compelling nose of baked spice. Raspberry pie, you get that really wonderful fresh fruit. Uh, warm red and black currants, rose hip tea and fragrant earth with a waft of wild sage. Medium bodied patterns filled with fragrant black red and black fruit, framed by great freshness and softness, supple tannins, finishing on a floral note. An absolutely beautiful wine. For the money, incredible. I'm going to I'm going to also have very briefly, and in fact, and I will apologize because of time. There's someone said I think um, I have not looked at the Clarendale, but I will do that very very quickly. Um, Chad seems to say in the back about the grapes. No, Cl Clarendale's a really interesting wine for so many reasons, even before you taste it, because it is named for Clarence Dillon, who's an American. Clarence Dillon bought Chateau Aubryon, and in the 30s or 40s, 30s must have been, or, you know, or, or after the war, I'm trying to remember. And of course, Clarence Dillon uh, was the Treasury, uh, Secretary of the Treasury um, for the Kennedy administration. And his family has continued to own it, and his granddaughter, I think it was, married the Prince of Luxembourg. And so, in fact, it is the Prince of Luxembourg who now runs or owns um, this winery. Uh, and it's out, out of Chateau Aubryon, one of the most fabled wineries uh, in Bordeaux, just south of Bordeaux. They also recently bought La Mission Embryon and own many, many other properties. And so this is their entry-level wine. And so I thought, you know, with a 16, which is another good vintage, it would be fun to try. It's darker than the Marjos. It has more, um, yeah, a lot more sort of, uh, uh, I think, sort of tannins, probably a little bit more wood than the Marjos does. At least that's what comes out in the nose. Very dark, um, plummy, and almost going then into a little bit of, of almost cocoa. 
Yeah, definitely Coco in the finish. Um, a little bit of that lead pencil, but really more of that chocolatey sort of cocoa in the finish. Nice fruit. Nice wine. It is, in fact, a very nice wine. If I had my druthers, I'd drink the Martus. Uh, But still, um, nothing wrong with the Clarendel at all. And so, and I know it's fairly widely available and they make a fair amount of it. And so that's why I put it up there as the alternative uh, for that. Questions, Emily? Yep. So um, the question we had that came in is about the Clarendale. He said he has a 2011 Clarendale um, and that the percentages of the Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc are different. Um, so do these blends have different percentages each year? Are they made the same each year or are they mixing it up? That's a great question. And it's one of those things, uh, and I know I have it somewhere probably in my um, uh, in my notes and papers. Every year in Bordeaux is different. The reason being is it, it gives them flexibility. You have these different grapes and you have a, you have a, a bad spring frost. Typically, Merlot comes out earlier than the Cabernet, and so it may be more effective than the Cabernet. The Merlot tends to ripen earlier, and so may miss the fall rains, and so if everything goes okay, the quality may be better, where it may rain on the cab, and even though cab's fairly thick-skinned and, and can stand it, it may not have been as good. So when they make wine, especially in Bordeaux, and in other places too, when they make a what they call their grand vin, in other words, the wine that they put their name on, they pick and choose from the various lots of wines to blend them the very best wine that they can. I was um, fairly well acquainted with the winemaker, the person who ran Chateau Lagrange, and I had a a list, and I'm sure I have it someplace, or, and maybe I, they will have it. I had the list of the various grapes that were in the wine from year to year, and they it, they ranged widely because some years are Merlot years, some years are Cabernet years, some years are Cabernet Franc years, and so they will they want to make the best wine they can. That's their Obviously, that's their intent because their name goes on it. And so they will use the best grapes that they have each year. And so, yes, it does change radically from year to year. Great. And that is our last question. Great. I have a few things to show. Um, what I thought I would do, and very, very briefly, um, I have always worn many hats at the university. And one of them, in fact, I lived, in fact, right near Silvor for a number of years. And I still uh, lead wildflower walks there. So, in fact, I ran down to the Silvor Biological Sanctuary. By the way, for those of you who are never there, it's right behind Pepper Park. And it is right off of Chestnut uh, on Silvor Lane, which is their oak or maple, maple, I guess, or, or you know, whatever comes down there past the, the um, Triver Center and down that way, it's sort of right off of that. So I thought I would show you some pictures of what is blooming today in Oxford. The first thing I would start is I thought I would get the nasties out of the way first. You see this, this nice green carpet with these bright yellow flowers? Kill it. This is Lesser Celandine, uh, Ficaria verna, if I remember my Latin properly. This is an extremely invasive plant. In fact, I was walking around my property a couple days ago, and I was surprised to see just a couple places. And because of how bad it is, I I dug it up, and I throw I I throw it in the garbage. I don't compost it. I throw it in the garbage to be taken away 
because it is extremely invasive in so many ways and and is very, very difficult to get rid of. And this is something, in fact, we are fighting at the sanctuary. The other one I would show you, and this, in fact, was the last thing I saw when I was walking through. In fact, I was actually walking through the, the, um, the lawn. This is poison hemlock. It looks a lot like wild carrot, but typically is larger. It tends to be bluish green. It also, luckily, you will not get a dermatitis if you touch it, but this is a, a, a European native. It's what killed Socrates. It is a poison. And so anywhere I see this plant, I spray it and or dig it out or do something I kill it. So I thought those are the bad guys I would get out of the way right away. Let's go to the nice things. Virginia bluebell, Mertensia virginiana, is blooming at the lane right now. And what's wonderful is they will self-seed and increase. And so you may have a place that looks like this after a while. Blue, uh, it's really interesting. I can go back. Bluebells, in fact, I think I have a picture someplace else. Most of, remember, our honeybees are not native. And so most of these flowers were what we call buzz pollinated. It's things like, you know, bumblebees and other plants under large or bees that will go to these flowers that are pendant, that hanging down. And so that's why you see so many of our wildflowers are this way. By the way, these are called spring ephemerals. The reason we call them spring ephemerals is because they basically get all their living done before the leaves come out in the trees. They grow, they bloom, they set seed, and then they're gone for the rest of the year. <clears throat> and that's what happens. Um, uh, flocks, uh, flocks de vericata, beautiful plants all over the place. Now in the lane, comes in a number of different colors, as you can see, blues, sort of pinkish and white. So very nice. And all these pictures I took today, the um, uh, may apples were just coming out. And it's interesting if it has one leaf, it has no flower. If it has two leaves, it has a flower. And there you see the flower bud, may apples. It's not May. They're not blooming yet, but you will see the flower buds on the emerging May apples. By the way, I also look for morels, which of course are wonderful mushrooms. I didn't find a, certain, a single one down in the lane. Here, of course, is a, a whole uh, umbrella full of, of May apples uh, there. And so they're there. Um, these are uh, trillium. There are a number of trillium in the lane. This is trillium sessile, uh, sometimes called toad shade. has all kinds of common names, uh, but just beautiful, especially the wonderful pictures on the or wonderful modeling on the leaves. They are so beautiful. Um, this uh, it's a flower that's quite common, but I really like. It used to be called, it was, it is this tooth wart. And as you can see, the leaf is very toothed. It used to be, in fact, in uh, the the Latin name was dentaria, dent, of course, for teeth. Now it's a, actually a cardamony, concatenata. But this is also a very, very common uh, wildflower that you will see at the moment and all over the lane. It's just about finishing up. White violets seem strange, but we have white violets, purple violets, and yellow violets in the lane. Um, these are just starting. Right now, we have all the bluebells. Next will come the delphiniums or larkspur, and they are just getting ready to flower. This is the earliest one I could find today uh, that was down there. Uh, false through an enemy, beautiful coverings of white down in the lane right there with, of course, a little bluebell. So pretty. This is twin leaf. Twin leaf, as you can see, almost like a butterfly, was named, in fact, its Latin name is Jeffersonia. It was named for Thomas Jefferson. And had you gone to the lane two weeks ago, it was just starting. This is the most ephemeral of the spring ephemerals because now they're all finished blooming. In fact, if you look very carefully on the, on the sort of right-hand side, you can see the seed pod for this. Luckily, they have been expanding down in the lane, but they're wonderful spring ephemerals, white flowers that bloom very, very quickly. This is what the lane looks like, at least part of it. I thought I would show you. Blue-eyed Mary. 
Dr. Hefner, of course, owned this area, and he brought the seeds of Kalenzia uh, to this, and it's a biennial, so it lives low and then comes and flowers the second year. And so these are beautiful blue-eyed Mary that are currently in the lane blooming. These are not blooming, but I thought I had to show them to you. These are nodding trillium. We have a number of trillium. And you can see, of course, they're nodding, but they're not blooming. So they're just getting ready to bloom. And with us having supposedly 82-degree weather tomorrow, by Monday, they'll be blooming because of the increase in temperature. Uh, these are prairie trillium. In fact, it took me a while to find them, and they're already blooming. Uh, another kind of trillium that, in fact, is in the lane. Uh, this is the true. What you saw earlier was the false ruin enemy. This is the true ruin enemy, anemonella. And they bloom in these wonderful little clusters, and so such a bright white flower. So pretty. Of course, Dutchman's breeches, because they look like pantaloons, upside down pantaloons, and beautiful leaves with them. Again, a little bit of uh, uh, other flowers, the flocks up above, but just blooming in the lane, so pretty. By the way, I don't expect it, but they are, in fact, edible, uh, as is our red buds, which are just starting. Um, I had to put this in. This is probably the last hepatica or liver leaf. You can see the flowers that are three lobed like your liver. And that white flower at the bottom was probably the last hepatica blooming. They're early bloomers. They were blooming two weeks ago. So they're basically done. Um, this was on the opposite. This was the first wild geranium that was blooming in the lane. It has this wonderful pink flower, wonderful plants. They're in the crane's bill, it's actually um, uh, a true geranium because the geraniums that you plant around your yard are pelargoniums. They're actually a native of South Africa. And so they're not true geraniums. The true geraniums, in fact, are their, what we call the stork's bill because they're long seed pods. And that is the flower. Um, these are called bellwort. Bell, wart is leaf. Um, I like it because the Latin name is uvularia. Just like your uvula, which of course hangs in the back of your throat, these flowers, this is perfoliate bellwort. This is a beautiful yellow flower. And I was actually pleased it has increased in the area in the lane also. Um, these are uh, dog tooth violets. They have many, many common names, adder's tongue because of the leaf, etc. And so they were blooming beautiful yellow. In fact, I was, I'll be honest, I was really pleased with that picture. Look at that flower. It is just glorious. It's so wonderful to see our spring ephemerals. Just great. And of course, it comes in white also. Uh, there used to be a tremendous amount of white dog tooth violets in Bishop Woods. Uh, these are yellow trillium, trillium luteum, but they're later brought, in fact, by Dr. Hefner. And so those are the beautiful leaves, all mottled yellow and white, and they will have yellow flowers, yellow trillium flowers, uh, probably by Monday again because of our warm weather, but they were not yet. Um, I thought I would show you. Many of you spent time at Pepper Park, and so this is the Pepper sh Shelter. I put this in especially as sort of a shout out to uh, alums who, in fact, have done many of my tastings in California and have fond memories of the Pepper Park Shelter. Um, I thought I would also show you the, the uh, tulips that are blooming uptown. Currently, the beds are just a riot of color. And so this is... Uh, the center of um, town uh, with the tulips and the uh, shell. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, is the Electric Roots Festival in town. So if you come to town, it will be really fun from two until nine. And then finally, again, so beautiful. This is Trillium Grandiflorum with a giant white flower. It was just there begging to be photographed. And so I thought I would have you enjoy that beautiful flower. So finally, happy spring from me and the Miami Alumni Association. Any questions, Emily? Nope, we do not have any questions. I probably overwhelmed them with flower pictures. I understand. <laughs> no, it was great. Have a great evening.
Well, thank you so much, Jack, for joining us tonight. And to all of you that um, tuned in, we had a lot of questions come in, so I apologize if we were not able to get to yours. Um, I invite you to check out the other Alumni Association webinars. They are free and open to all. Um, this week or this upcoming week, we actually have three on-campus conferences that we are bringing to you virtually. So our Center for Community, Community Engagement is celebrating um, 20 years on Thursday, and we'll have programming throughout the day. The College of Engineering and Computing has their conference on Friday and has five different sessions throughout the day on Friday. And then Miami Women, hence my shirt, has programming on Thursday and Friday. Um, on Thursday evening, they have Hawk Tank, which is a spin off of, or kind of put our own Miami spin on Shark Tank, um, but with Miami student groups. Um, and then on Friday, our leadership symposium um, with four amazing alumni and faculty speakers. So all of these virtual conferences can be found on our webinar site, um, the same one that you're watching this on, which is alumlc.org backslash Miami OH. Again, these are all conferences happening on campus, but we are going to bring them um, to you virtually in a hybrid setting. So please be sure to tune into that and or to those. And with all of that being said, thank you again, Jack, and I hope you have the great a great rest of your evening.